Well, I had a great introduction story that I was going to tell today, but since it had to do with the weather, I knew that I wasn't allowed to do it, so I'm going to be rather boring and just get straight to the point. Amen. Amen. I see how it is. So, speaking of getting to the point, today's gospel passage kind of begins at an odd point, doesn't it? And he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled. What? Well, I feel that Father Chris and I have both said that a few times in the last couple of months, that the lectionary begins on kind of an odd point today. But Luke chapter 4, we're going to rewind just a little bit. Luke chapter 4 begins with the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, and right after that, Jesus begins his public ministry. He goes to Nazareth and is given a scroll to read, and the one handed to him is the scroll from the prophet Isaiah. Now, Luke 17 tells us that he unrolled the scroll and found in it the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then it tells us he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were upon him. And now finally, we're at the beginning of our gospel, where it says, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. That is what he's talking about, referring to the quote from Isaiah chapter 62 that Jesus had just read. Now these people don't really know exactly what to do with him at this point, do they? Again, earlier in the chapter, Luke tells us that a report about him and about his teaching had gone throughout all the surrounding country, and the people were excited about this man. The people were excited about this man who preaches and teaches with authority. Luke tells us that they marveled at his gracious words. Rabbis at the time often quoted other rabbis. That was mainly what they did, passing down one quote to another, to another, and to another. But this man named Jesus... He teaches, and he teaches with authority. He teaches with the authority of God himself, and not only that, but he does things to back that authority up. He performs healings, and he performs miracles. And they ask themselves, who is this? Who is this man? Is this not Joseph's boy? The Jewish audience is thinking that Jesus, at this point, is still just another prophet, just another guy telling stories, just another guy doing some miraculous works. Though the prophets, if you remember, tell of news or events for the future, Jesus is speaking of change now for you, not only for your future generations, but for you today. Throughout his ministry on earth, Jesus will be telling us that the Messiah Messiah is no longer coming, but that he has come and that he has come to bring salvation to us all. He's come to bring salvation But he's also come to bring grace. Now the Jews have seen these things and they've heard of these miracles that are attesting to God's reality in Jesus. They should be ready to receive him, but they're not. Now remember this. Remember their words. Remember their denial. Remember them because it's easy for us to scoff at them and to judge them for their denial. It's easy for us to laugh at the Jewish people for failing to recognize the Messiah while standing in his presence. But if we're not watchful, remember how easy it is for us to stand in his presence and live as if we're no longer waiting for his second coming. Live as if we don't know that he's coming again. We know that Israel has a a history of rejecting the prophets because God sends them to say unpopular things. They're unpopular because they tell of God's righteous judgment and call us to make changes that we often don't want to make. We still see that today. The issues the world is struggling with and fighting with and fighting over are dealt with in our scriptures given to us from God. Issues of sexuality, of identity, of sin, of fallen nature. The message is often not popular at all, and we like the Jews, often tend to either give in to the prevailing culture or we often outright ignore them. We fail to see the truth, and when we do so, we lose our witness for the sake of the views of the world. We scoff at the Jews who scoffed at Jesus while rejecting his presence 
in rejecting his return with our own hearts and in our own lives. Now, moving along, we get to Jesus' important comment about physician, heal yourself, which is due to the miracles that he had performed at Capernaum. Now, remember when you were younger and you made a face behind your parents' back? Or if you're married, you made a face behind your wife's back? What did they do? Every single time, what did they do? I remember it because it happened yesterday. But I remember it because even though they were facing the complete opposite direction and there were no mirrors or reflective items, there was no refrigerator door or microwave door that they could see you in, what did they say? You know I can see you. And it scared the daylights out of you, didn't it? Now, imagine Jesus calling you out. Not for making a silly face behind his back, but on the thoughts that you're thinking on the inside. If that doesn't scare you, scra- scare you straight, I don't know what will. Talk about an attention getter. You see, at Capernaum, he had many Gentiles. And these Gentiles were the ones that were receiving the healing and the miracles. And this is the way the Jews, Jewish people were saying, Jesus, you healed the less deserving people. What about us? Now, they weren't saying it out loud yet, but they were saying it in their minds and in their hearts. What about us? What about God's chosen people? You healed them. Surely, how much more will you heal us? I don't know about you, but I've said the same thing. When my grandmother, who was a godly, godly woman, died of cancer, and then I knew people who lived horrible lives that were healed of cancer. What about us? What about God's people? What about us? You healed them. Surely, how much more will you heal us? Jesus knew the hearts of those present and knew what they were thinking, just as he knows our hearts and our own thoughts as well. Now, then we come to the uh, statement about the widows in Israel. What does that mean? If you remember, the story referenced here is from 1 Kings 17, and it would be one that the crowd knew very, very well. In the midst of a severe drought, God sent Elijah, I'm going to have to read this word, to Zarephath, to ask a widow for bread and water. Now remember in the story how she told him that she had only enough for herself and for her son. What did Elijah say? He pleaded with her, and he told her to feed him in faith, because the Lord has told me that the jar of meal shall not empty, nor the jar of oil, until Yahweh sends rain. She did as Elijah said, and the Bible tells us that she and her family ate for many, many days. But later, her son dies, and Elijah cried out to the Lord three times to give him life, and he does. What a great story, right? I just talked of people being healed and not being healed, and here we have one, being healed. What a great story, right? Someone acts with faith and is rewarded. When calamity strikes... They receive a miracle. That sounds great, and it is. Why were the Jews upset with this? Because guess what? The widow and her son were Gentiles, and the audience would have known that as well. Then Jesus goes on to tell the story of Elisha and the lepers. If you know this story as well, it's from 2 Kings 5. You can see where I'm going with this. Remember, only one leper was cleansed. Naaman, the Syrian Gentile. Jesus is telling them, by telling them these stories and using these phrases, he's telling them that his kingdom is not exclusive for the Jews, but that this kingdom is for all. The Jewish people were picking up on this as well and were enraged to the point where they were desiring to throw Jesus off of a cliff. We see that they consider Isaiah 61.1 which Jesus quoted to them in verses 18 through 19 of today's gospel as being a promise exclusive to them and exclusive to the nation of Israel and God's chosen people. He has sent me to bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to open the prison, and to free those who are bound. They expect this coming Messiah to free them from Rome and to establish an earthly kingdom with earthly peace earthly prosperity, and earthly promises. Now again, does that sound familiar? 
If we pay attention to the teachings of some Christians today, we would think that we're still waiting on our Savior to give us an earthly kingdom that not only fits his desires and his will, but one that fits our culture, our desires, our habits, our financial needs, our own chosen freedoms. But if we go down that line of thinking, if we forget that our Savior comes not from Washington or the state lottery office or the bank or the old neighborhood or even anywhere near our neck of the woods, but has come already to earth in the plainest way possible and died the most horrible death imaginable for all of us, then we miss the point, and we, if we stray too far, we miss the kingdom. And that is the message we need to hear from today's gospel lesson, that the promise in the Old Testament, that the witness of the faithful, that the words of the prophets, the lowly manger at the birth of Jesus, the grace and the love in his message, the redemption through the gruesome sacrifice on the cross, the new covenant, the hope of glory, the resurrection of the dead, the life of the world to come is here for us all, and it is open for us all. I love the words in the song that we just sung, where he says, What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, and the poor. It stings, doesn't it? It stings. It stings because we know that we have been the weakest. We have been the vilest. We have been the poorest. But it stings because I think when I hear that, how many times have I passed somebody by? How many times have I not let my witness to the world speak its truth as I passed someone by because they were weak or vile or poor. We need to remember as Jesus is beginning his earthly ministry in these passages, as Jesus is building his witness in these passages for his earthly ministry, we as believers today and every day are called to be witnesses of this message of hope and of restoration and of freedom from death to this world that so needs to hear it. This world that so needs for us to live as faithful witnesses who believe that Jesus has come for all, and not only that, but believers who live like we know that he will come again. So in closing, I want to encourage us all, myself included, to consider our lives and to consider our actions and the story that they tell about us, the story that tells us where we are in our walk with Jesus and the story that tells the world that is watching us to see if we really believe what we say we do. Consider that. No, you'll never be perfect. You never will. But strive to live a life of faith. Strive to live a life of witness to the world, one of love, one of forgiveness, one of grace. And remember, again, praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Thank God for that. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. In the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.